Okay, it's good to be here today. My name is Matt Cedarberg, and I'll be talking about how much more simulation could you complete if you didn't have to mesh. Okay, so just to introduce myself uh, before I get started, my previous life I had a company called T-Splines, which introduced a new way to make CAD models to a number of industries, including automotive design, architecture, our, um, industrial design or consumer products, jewelry. We commercialized this technology through plugins to Rhino and SolidWorks, and then a little over a decade ago, Autodesk acquired this. Now the T-Splines technology is available in Fusion 360 and then Venter and Dynamo. And I left Autodesk about eight years ago to start a new company with some co-founders to introduce a new way to run finite element analysis. And that's what I'd like to talk with you about today. And before, I guess to motivate that, I'd like to talk about two things that happened in 1965 that brought me here today. The first one was a book released by a young lawyer named Ralph Nader called Unsafe at Any Speed. And in this, he opened a lot of visibility into the lack of accountability for safety in the automotive industry. It opened with a memorable line, for over half a century, the automobile has brought death, injury, and the most inestimable sorrow and deprivation to millions of people. That got the attention of the American public. This became a national bestseller, got the attention of Congress. Ralph Nader testified before Congress about what was happening in the automotive industry. And this led to the institution of the National Highway Tra Traffic Safety Administration Board, and eventually to the requirement of automotive crash tests before cars could be sold in the United States. So this is what these crash tests looked like back then. We don't like to smash these automobiles, but this is the only way to simulate the actual conditions which can establish the design criteria so believe it or not, that really helped. And um, today, we're about the, the likelihood of us dying in a car crash is one fifth what it was uh, back in 1965. So for a long time, that was the only way to improve safety. But interestingly, back in that same year, 1965, the beginning of a new method that would eventually improve safety happened. And that was the development of the first mainstream finite element analysis code, NASTRAN. And so what finite element allows you to do is to digitally test what you could only previously test physically to enable uh, better design and manufacture of many products. So finite elements progressed to the point where decades later now it can be used to predict automotive safety. So here's an example from LS Dyna, which has been the gold standard in FEA simulation for automotive. You can see you can actually predict much more with FEA because you can instrument it, you can repeat, uh, you can, um, it's cheaper and faster. Um, just the, uh, FEA has really benefited a lot of industries and now it's a seven billion dollar a year industry. But increasingly over the last few decades there's been an emerging elephant in the room when it comes to the workflow for finite element analysis. And that has come about because of the emergence of CAD for computer-aided design. And when FEA started to be used in the 1970s, there was no CAD. And so when you're given a design to simulate, it was just part of doing business. You had to build an FEA model using the math that was used in all of the FEA codes, these Lagrangian finite elements. You can see that those tend to be faceted uh, representations. As CAD came into play, then there began to be a much bigger um, pain in setting up the, these finite element models. So at Coreform, for the last decade, we've been interacting and interviewing hundreds of analysts, and we've come to realize that in the terms of Ralph Nader, for over half a century, preparing models for FEA has brought pain, tedium, and inestimable sorrow to hundreds of thousands of analysts. So again, the, the issue here is, is the connection with CAD. When AutoCAD was finally introduced in the 1980s, Again, not so much pain there because it's just a 2D draft. You create the finite element model anyway. But beginning in the mid-90s, when SOLIDWORKS came to the stage and, and CATIA and, and, and X and Pro-E were more mature, now the analyst, instead of being given a, a paper drawing or a 2D drawing, he was given a fully detailed 3D model that some engineer had spent 
potentially months preparing, and his task was to undo a lot of that work, to remove a lot of details, remove a lot of fillets, change the math representation. That can take weeks in complex analyses for automotive and other industries. Um, no one really likes to do that. Uh, there's a lot of engineers I've met that have started to enter the field of FEA and then left because it's really demotivating to do this job that has no business value. There's no reason to spend a good chunk of your life just reworking data in another math representation. So um, about 20 years ago, a group of um, leading FEA researchers decided that again, given, given this current state status of, of how FEA is just not integrated into CAD, could there be a better way? Could there be a way of rather than spending up to 90% of the overall time to solution in just reworking the data and then running a simulation on something less accurate than the CAD and then having it be difficult to go back to the CAD because there's no straightforward way to add the insights and the whole point of running analysis anyway is to improve the design but if it takes so long that there's no time to improve the design, it's just this pass fail at the end of the product design process, we're really underutilizing the value that could be driven from finite elements. So um, people have tried to come up with new CAD representations for various reasons. The interesting thing is though that of all of the new CAD representations that have come out in the last recent years, I mean, NTOP's been one that's been mentioned today as well as, other, as, well as others, no one has picked finite element math as the basis for creating new CAD software. And the reason is because finite element math is good for really nothing besides finite elements. So there's, to kind of pick your poison with how you represent finite elements, you can either use hex meshes, which are the most accurate and um, performant and robust, but the only problem is it's a very manual process to create these. At best, it's semi-automated and um, and so that's kind of on the one side. The other side, you can make, use tetrahedra, which can be automatically generated, but they can be very expensive to compute because of the element quality. So to get the automated ability to add these tet elements to fill up a volume, you sacrifice the, the aspect ratios. You, you, the Jacobians are, are much more poor, and that just leads to a less predictable and a, a longer solve time. So since no one's picking FEA math to make CAD, what if we um, flipped it and said, well, what if an FEA code could be created based on the mathematics of CAD? So that's what we're doing at CoreForm. This is part of a larger field called isogeometric analysis. The, these papers were first published about 20 years ago. There's been over 4,000 papers now published exploring the idea of using CAD math as a basis of FEA. And it turns out that these higher order smooth spline basis functions that are used to define CAD are actually more accurate, more robust, and uh, better behaved than the traditional Lagrange elements used for FEA. And so it, it's really creating a new, a new solver that's based on the superset of the technology that was first implemented in NASR in 1965. So uh, my business partners in Corf at Coreform and I have created this new solver called Coreform Flex. And this drastically accelerates simulation workflows. And so we just take the CAD part, we prepare it for simulation through Coreform Flex, and then we run the simulation on the fully detailed CAD geometry. The way that we do this is we leverage the trimming capabilities inherent in the CAD. So what trimming is, this is the basis of modern CAD. CAD's comprised of analytic surfaces or nerve surfaces that are rectangular. So to create something that's not rectangular, you just kind of cut it out. Like cutting out a piece of paper. And what you have left is what you use as that part of the CAD. So to create a more complex CAD model, you just cut out a lot of pieces of paper and stick them together, and, and that's CAD. But the one thing is, even though this is called solid CAD, it's actually hollow inside, and so you can't use that for simulation. So if you want to run a simulation, how are you going to parameterize the volume? And so we just extend this concept of trimming to three dimensions. And so we take the CAD, we, we immerse it in a volumetric um, Rect rectilinear high order smooth spline mesh, and we just trim out that mesh with the CAD, and then we have an interior parameterization that we can use to simulate on. And this, really what this nets is just a reduced human cost of simulation. So there's three key benefits that are available now through Coreform Flex. First is the ability to have fully automatic model generation. Second is to be compatible with all CAD data. 
And then the, the kicker is that this also gives you superior accuracy even for advanced nonlinear physics. I mentioned earlier that with simulation, part of the pain is when you're running nonlinear simulation, especially with the automotive and defense customers that we work with, the vast majority of their time is spent just preparing data to actually run the simulation. That makes it difficult to automate simulation, it makes it hard to do design iterations. And so by driving all of that data prep, which again has no business value, when you come in from the outside, it's completely surprising that so much of their time is just spent representing something from one math pipe to another in a non-automated way. By driving that down to zero, then simulation can be much more accessible and integrated into the design process. So anecdotally, as we've, as we've done problems together with customers, we save about 50% cost savings for a project. And that huge savings is in this upfront labor time where we just drive that mesh creation time to zero. This is the version one solver right now. Um, and so there's parts that we're still optimizing. For instance, our model setup, we don't have two decades worth of pre-processing polish that we've added yet. So that's a little bit more expensive today. Our simulation code isn't optimized yet, so that's a little bit more expensive. But even so, that time saved that you don't need to mesh is so significant that even today there's significant time savings. Given the chance to write a new solver, we wanted to avoid the mistakes that came in the past with people not talking to each other. And we've generalized the solver so that it can work with any CAD type where you can define it, where you can run an inside-outside test for a given point. So BRFs aren't watertight, but within a tolerance, you can tell if any point is inside or outside that. The same can be said with implicit definitions, surface meshes. Um, and so today we've been focusing on, on this running, working for traditional CAD with BRFs. We have completed prototypes with implicit definitions and surface meshes. And one of the reasons that I'm here is to talk to this crowd and see if we can accelerate, get some more customer demand to push those, those parts of the workflow forward as well. Lastly, the way that Core from Flex differentiates from other new simulation codes is, is the superior accuracy in automation. For as long as I've been in the industry, there's been different codes that have come up focused on having a better simulation workflow for designers to push simulation more up front to give you insight early in the design process. And there's absolutely a place for those in product design workflows. But where those fall down is then when the analyst needs to verify that everything's actually correct, analysts don't trust those tools. And so these have to ruin everything in Abacus or, or Diner Ansys anyway. So by coming up with a code that is a true finite element method that's been vetted by thousands of research papers that we can demonstrate. So here's just one example where um, with this, this simple C um, bracket, simulation where we compress down on, on a ball bearing, the, we can converge faster than traditional uh, P1 linears that are still the standard for nonlinear non -linear dynamics. We get higher accuracy per degree of freedom. The robustness is superior. So we get all those benefits that you'd usually see with the hex elements that I showed with finite elements, but also the speed and automation that everyone uses TET elements for. And so finally, we do have a path forward where we can get both the accuracy and the automation in a single element definition. So we've, um, with that background, the question is, well, how much more simulation could you complete now with, with Core Form Flex if you didn't need to go through all that manual preparation time each time you wanted to run a simulation? So today, uh, so Core Form Flex is a, a solver. Uh, we also have a preprocessor. And the available physics commercially is, is linear static today, but we have a lot of beta nonlinear capabilities that our customers are exercising as well. And uh, I'll just share some examples with you about, about what you can do today. So to start with a linear static example, the examples that I'll, I'll be sharing are more geometrically complex because that's where core form flex really shines. The, the higher geometric complexity is just as easy for us as the low geometric complexity. So unlike with meshing where the more small details you have, it, the mesh can just explode with degrees of freedom. With, with core form flex, that's not an issue. And the way that we can control uh, how accurate or um, we can get insights into different quantities of interest is just by the resolution of the background grid that we immerse this in. So that can, that's defined on the part level. And so with the different parts in the, in the assembly, you can determine which you want more resolution in. 
For more serious application, uh, we can run contact and large deformation. This is the trailer hitch used to trans, uh, transport missiles. And so it's, it's important that this behave as intended. And again, with, with the with core form flex, we are, this is a project with, in conjunction with Sandia National Lab. We're able to have high accuracy contact and large deformation even with these complex geometries. A couple of examples for additive manufacturing for this crowd. We've been working with uh, RTX on demonstrating being able to determine accurate stresses on additively manufactured finstock chambers. And um, as well as, here's an implicit dynamic um, simulation with contact, then together with Honeywell, Honeywell for direct ink write pads. Uh, the issue here is that even something that seems like simple geometry, when you try to put a hex mesh on this, that can take hours of work because you have to partition it to get a nicely behaved hex mesh. The minute you change the diameter, you have to repeat all that work. And Honeywell was given the chance to design these, um, these direct ink write pads, but you can't, they could only design things that they could simulate. And so if you can't simulate it, that really narrows the design space. And with Core Form Flex, again, that, it, that enables the full automation of exploring uh, many types of designs. Uh, example of large deformation, so you use a flex cable bending. Uh, this again, was used in, in a missile, and when you, when you put a flex cable on that, you want it to be good for decades to not malfunction. And so they need, need, they need to accurately understand whether anything was going to delaminate after they bent it. This is a surprisingly complex uh, hex meshing exercise. This is for simplification. We only had it be this thick, but there's many elements to the thickness that can really um, explode in, the, in the, how expensive that is to create and compute. And with core form flex, even with uh, these thin wall uh, structures, we can have less than one element through the thickness in our background grid. So it's a very efficient way, even with things that you traditionally do with shells, with core form flex, you can do those as a solid as well without needing to get a mid surface. Uh, the last example I'll show uh, is just the yielding of metal parts. Again, with, with core form flex, we can do um, all sorts of linear, nonlinear plasticity. If we haven't implemented it yet, it's because a customer hasn't asked for it yet. So I'd, I'd welcome uh, any, any requests um, from, from any of you in the crowd. The reason to come to places like this is, is to meet and to understand what applications um, there may be for, for what software you might be creating. And so I'd welcome the chance to interact with any of you. It feels like, again, there's never enough chance to talk with everyone in the hall afterwards. I'd love to talk to you even off offline. So if you want to scan this QR code, we can figure out a time in the next week or so. We can find my schedule and we can meet for 15 minutes. Um, but I'm excited to get you access to Core Form Flux for you to have a chance to see, I mean, what, what could you simulate without needing to mesh? And um, thank you very much.